It's, it's wonderful to see the range of, of, of people who are interested in space, who are contributing to space, uh, and, and we shouldn't make light of the fact that we have more and more artists and more and more um, people coming from outside the industry uh, to give some uh, help to those of us who have been uh, in it for some time. Uh, how do I get the, do you get? Ah, okay, uh, there you go. Um, so I'm going to do something a little different uh, today. Uh, I'm going to start with the future and then go into who we are. Uh, they had asked uh, me to come up and talk about uh, plans for our own private uh, space station. And uh, so I begin with that, and then I'll give some background on our company, Nanorex. The way we look at it, you just heard from Virgin Orbit. We heard uh, from, uh, uh, we all know all the launch vehicles. You know there's 70, 80, 90 uh, companies working launch vehicles. Um, and, and what the last decade has been really the decade of finally uh, having the opportunity to get to space in a variety of different ways. What we see over the next two decades is that it's going to witness a revolution in destinations. And, and you know, right now we have one space station. We call them outposts going forward, but one space station. I, I'm very lucky. In the 90s, I worked on the uh, Russian space station Mir. And uh, I helped commercialize it. And, and uh, the International Space Station is my second space station. And I, I guess I'm going for the trifecta. I hope to work on uh, more than uh, two. And I've really spent my career working on space stations. And finally, through advances in technology, we see the opportunity, with not only the advances in technology, but finally the robustness of the transportation. Gives us a chance to talk about having outposts in space. And I'll talk more about what we're thinking. So, the way we're looking at it now, we don't want to go from having one space station in the 90s to one space station today to maybe two with, let's say, the Chinese. That's not an ecosystem. That's not a marketplace. We had that already in, tra in transportation with the space shuttle. We had one. It doesn't do any good from a market viewpoint. So what we envision, what we want, what we're working at at Nanorax is to have multiple space stations in different orbits. Some are crude, some are robotic, some are uh, for industrial manufacture, some are for tourists. But how do you do that? It's really expensive. And so we brought back an old von Braun idea. And uh, on the left, this is a, a little bit wrong, but I'll explain. In 1960, von Braun, Werner von Braun, and importantly for me to say as director of Marshall Space Flight Center, not in his previous occupation, okay? But as, direct, as director, <laughs> it's important. I mean, uh, I should just simply say the director of the Marshall Space Flight Center in the 1960s said, look, if we want to do space stations, let's reuse the second stage of a vehicle once the fuel is spent. Can we reuse it as a facility, a platform? And on the left is von Braun's handwritten design for a Saturn, the Saturn, and he wanted the second stage to be, um, there's a Saturn V conversion, uh, and so um, his, his goal was to make that a space station. And in fact, America's first space station, Skylab, was a second stage of a Saturn. However, the technology at the time did not permit it to be a spent second stage. The technology and all the furnishings was done on the ground. It was just an empty second stage that went up uh, as a space station. On the right, the diagram's a little off. On the right, uh, NASA looked at it again in the 1980s with the uh, uh, shuttle program and said, can we do this now in the, in the 1980s? And this is from NASA in the 80s with the external tank. And still they said, nope, we can't do it. So NASA has a program called Next Steps. And as you'll learn, Nanorax were the largest uh, commercial user of the International Space Station. And we're very concerned about what comes next, what do we do? And I went to NASA in 2016 and said, hey, why don't we look at the old von Braun idea? And they said, no, no, we've looked at it twice. 
It's impossible. You can't refurbish a fuel tank, a spent fuel tank, once it's in space. And here I am, I'm not an engineer, and here I am saying to NASA, I don't know, call me crazy, but there's been advances in technology since 1985. Uh, why don't we look at it again? And for a year, I just hit on him, and finally they said, okay, submit, and we were awarded part of the Next Steps uh, contract. And uh, what we proposed was to look at the second stage of the Atlas V, and could it be repurposed uh, uh, in space uh, once it finishes mission. On the right is what it looks like, give you a sense of the size. And if you ever have a chance to go to Decatur, Alabama and see these things coming off the production line, it's pretty awesome because it's real and exists today. And on the left is how we see the uh, second stage. We call outposts and we call them independents, so independence one. And uh, this is uh, robotically how uh, uh, you can bring together, you can use robots. Uh, we undertook a five-month study funded by NASA, and to everyone's surprise, not only did we show that using today's robotics, we worked with MDA Robotics, now part of Maxar, using robots that are today on the surface of, of Mars, not only could we repurpose a spent fuel tank in space, but here comes the really cool part, we could do it without people. That changes everything. It changes everything. It gives you scalability. Instead of talking about doing one module for half a billion or a billion dollars, now you can drop these modules off wherever the vehicle is going. And so for us, though, Outpost is not simply a pro uh, program. It's not simply hardware. It's an ecosystem. And what we are hoping, what we are working towards, is where you can have uh, uh, repurposed upper stages. Again, some are industrial uh, factories. Uh, some can be human rated. Uh, they can be attached uh, you know, to the International Space Station. Personally, and I know NASA's coming up with a competition soon, so I have to be careful. But we're really looking closely, is it better to be away from the station than to be part of the station? Uh, we love the International Space Station, but if the rules are a little more lenient, if there's a little more freedom, it, 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 there may be uh, reasons to be a little further away. And then as the previous speakers today, if you've been at the uh, other sessions, we're, we're, you know, we're working with partners who would bring um, uh, Re-entry vehicles down. Uh, you need or, uh, you need uh, tugs that going between the different uh, platforms. So uh, for us, this is the means to have an ecosystem, uh, not only in low Earth orbit. Of course, these vehicles do not just go to low Earth orbit. It can be used for deep space. It can be used for geo. So we, right now, uh, the status for the outpost program at Nanorax is we were awarded the initial NASA study. And then this summer, we got a next step, a next phase of the next step program. And we're doing a ground demo. We're bringing in a uh, Centaur, the second stage of an Atlas V that did not pass production. It got a dent in it, and we're bringing that to Marshall, and we're going to outfit the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the vehicle, the hardware, and really get to know it. And we're building up our expertise in autonomous software, in robotics, and all the things that we see necessary to have a, a commercial uh, platform. And so uh, this is just one of the designs that the, the guys have come up with. Uh, and as it says, they call them wet labs. There's really nothing new in space. It's just the technology uh, and uh, implementation. Um, and, and so um, the, the size of these things is incredible. It's the, one of these uh, converted upper stages of an Atlas V, the Centaur, would have a uh, volume bigger than the biggest uh, module on the International Space Station. And I'm not sure. I, I don't think I go into it in this uh, presentation, but you know we've been working on designs where you dock them together, you can spin them to get gravity. There's no limitation to what you can do. If you, it, I mean, the takeaway message is, uh, you know, folks, 
stop throwing away assets when they're in space. And I don't know how well you know the, uh, how the International Space Station architecture works, um, but when I'm trying to explain this industry to people, I tell them that, look, we send cargo ships up to the International Space Station, and they, the astronaut, they dock to the station, or berth, the astronauts take the cargo out, and half of the cargo ships, what do we do? We stuff them full of garbage, and we burn them. I mean, what an extraordinary Christmas gift for the aerospace community. I mean, what a waste of precious assets. I mean, here you have, when something is in space, it's, it's priceless, it's there. And yet we burn them up now. And, and instead, the whole idea that we're pursuing uh, uh, with the Outpost program is, first you start with the second stages, and just as Elon Musk and Bezos are reusing the first stage, we're trying to figure out how to reuse the second. We're talking to other launch vehicle operators, not just with the Atlas, uh, both domestic and international. And for us, that, it's a huge step, but it is only a first step because, you know, why do we abandon big satellites? Why do we abandon things in orbit? So think of this as the greening of the space exploration movement, I suppose, is, is, a, is a way to say it. And, and um, this really summarizes the way we're looking at the next generation of space stations, is that, is that it cannot be government dominated, cannot be, there will never be another space station in low Earth orbit, like the International Space Station. The modular approach, started by the Russians on the Mir, the modular approach may be engineering-wise wonderful, politically wonderful, but it is really bad from a utilization viewpoint. You don't want an astronaut on an exercise bike when you're trying to do fiber optic uh, or Zeblan production in the next module. We've known this for 25 years but we still do it. And what we see as the future is, is um, an ecosystem approach where uh, you don't have one, you have several, you have tugs, you have an entire marketplace uh, that builds on the legacy of the International Space Station, builds on the lessons learned, not just in technology, but also in how we work with space agencies. And so when we look at the uh, uh, commercial potential, uh, this and realize when we show a chart like this, uh, it's per space station. So again, you wouldn't do this all on one space station. So uh, in other words, the one on the left would be the robotic. Uh, you'd have one or two uh, in differing orbits that would be for industrial uh, production. And then uh, if you had a space hotel um, or if you had something for professional astronauts, um, I'll take a moment to talk about the satellite services. When we look at NanoRex, when we look at the future 10 years out, and again, you've been hearing this, 70 launch vehicles. For us, the future is, let's say you have two, three, four dozen launch vehicles in uh, 10 years. In our mind, my mind, half of what they carry up will be satellites, but the other half will be raw materials. And there will be raw materials uh, that go to industrial platforms to manufacture finished products in space, mostly for the in-space market. So I think the whole idea of, of what those launch vehicles take up is going to change. At Nanorax now, we've deployed over 200 satellites from the International Space Station, and more and more of our customers are asking us to do what we call a store and deploy, where you bring a satellite up, you keep it there until you need it. And you know, it's gonna be a long time before we have instantaneous launch. And when you deploy today, Maybe you deployed on Thursday because the weather was good. Maybe you deployed on Thursday because the Air Force cleared the range. Maybe you didn't want to deploy on Thursday. And so there's a role for space stations in many different markets in many interesting ways. And once we can get beyond that we have one controlled by a government, then you can really see the uh, market emerge. 
talk about Nanorax uh, for a moment. Uh, we say we're the world's first commercial, commercial space station company with customers. And that part is the most important to me. Okay, so we're in the customer business. It's not the hardware. It is not the hardware. And this is what our customers have use of today. And uh, we're very proud. We work with Blue Origin, New Shepard on doing the payload integration. We built some of the racks on uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, we're building a, uh, the Bishop airlock. Right now is in manufacture. We're building an airlock uh, on the space station. It will be five times larger than the current airlock on the station, the Japanese. Why are we doing that? Because we see markets for satellite deployment and cargo in and out of the International Space Station. And we're foolishly or not privately funding it. And uh, it's now at Talis Alenia going to final, final manufacture. First was in uh, Alabama with Boeing. Both Boeing and Talis Alenia are partners with us on the airlock. Um, we've also deployed over 230 or 250 satellites off of the station. We're using other, um, other uh, carriers now as well. And um, we, we own the largest range of privately owned hardware on the International Space Station. Uh, and uh, we have uh, nanolabs, plate readers, all sorts of different things. And it's worth saying that when we started nine years ago, Nanorax was the first company in the world to own and operate its own hardware on the International Space Station. Nobody had done that before. We were the first company to set prices. You'd mention a price nine years ago to NASA, and everybody in the room would go, oh, you don't mention price. You know, just stop, you don't do that. You know, it's like you know, beneath them. This is, you know, and, and I'd walk in and say, look, we want to go to schools for, for our mixed sticks program. Uh, we've, we've now, we have a subsidiary, Dream Up, um, with, for education. We've sent 160 schools to the International Space Station. I may be off a little bit. And uh, our, our least expensive price for, for students is $15,000 US for 30 days on the station. And newsflash, we don't make any money on that, <laughs> okay? But, it, you know, it's kind of the right thing to do. I mean, so, so uh, in the beginning, NASA was like, first off, why should we let nanoracks do this? We do this. I'm like, well, you know, you're NASA, you're the government, you don't do things efficiently. And, and, uh, and also, Everything was peer group. So if you wanted to, uh, to, to fly with NASA 10 years ago, a committee had to decide. And early on, there was a woman at NASA who said to me, I don't understand nanoracks. How do you prioritize your payloads? And I was like, well, when the check clears the bank, you get to go to the space station. And they were appalled. They were horrified. I mean, and, and so we have an agreement with NASA, we don't do souvenirs, we don't do, you know, coffee mugs, uh, but we have sent 750 payloads to the station, and uh, nobody is, I mean, there's nothing close, and, uh, and uh, we've had multiple pharmaceutical, a woman was asking earlier, we've had multiple pharmaceutical clients, we've had basic materials, we've had research, um, we recently, uh, two years ago, we uh, uh, were able to to work within the Wolf Amendment, but still invited uh, chi first commercial Chinese customer to the International Space Station, uh, Beijing Institute of Technology, which did a fascinating study uh, on synthetic DNA. And they've shown first by flying on their platform and then a reflight on the ISS that um, you get damage to uh, DNA uh, when it's been exposed to the space environment. And obviously this has great uh, ramifications for our desire to travel to Mars and to be a species that goes into planetary. And so what exactly is causing this damage? Is it the radiation? Is it the microgravity? Uh, and so it was very difficult for us to get, we got it through first the Obama administration and then uh, the Republican uh, Congress agreed to this project. And one of the stipulations I promised those in Congress was that the Beijing Institute of Technology would publish their results in English. They did that about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, in a very rigorous study showing once again they're seeing damage in the DNA uh, in, uh, in DNA that's been exposed in the space uh, environment. So, I mean, why does, uh, I guess, uh, so some of our customers, um, 
Uh, this is a little heavy on the uh, Middle East. I'm leaving tomorrow for, uh, for Abu Dhabi, so uh, we change this around at different times. But um, uh, one of the issues that's, that's in the rage in Washington today is, you know, Jeff, you say you're commercial, but you have ESA and you have NASA up there as customers. Well, they are for us customers. I mean, uh, it's, it's my hardware on the space station. My investors paid for this hardware. We own it, and NASA uses it, or ESA uses it, so they're commercial customers. And people say, no, no, it's NASA. They can't. No, I mean, when NASA books a flight to come to Boston, the, you know, on JetBlue, it's, I mean, it's a rough analogy, but when NASA, I mean, it's, they're paying a ticket, they're commercial. So this is the range of, of the customers. As Robbie mentioned this morning, we're very proud to work with Planet, we've worked with Spire uh, and uh, Made in Space. We work with pharmaceutical companies uh, and uh, a range. I think it's we're up to 32 nations now, uh, and uh, and and growing rapidly. Um, so uh, I think that's it. Uh, so at Nanorax, we're in the space station business. This is something new. This is something that's still a little bit ahead. We see the markets. We know that the marketplace is there on existing markets today, like satellite deployment, in-space manufacture. For us, for me personally, the space station, the International Space Station, uh, is a proven ground. It's a proven ground for how you work in space, how you work with space agencies. And so, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to work, and we work now with NASA, with the European Space Agency, with DLR, the German Space Agency. We work with um, a UAE Space Agency, um, and, and so JAXA, we're beginning to work with the Japanese Space Agency. Uh, and so it's unlocking what we have today and taking that and going a decade out and envisioning an ecosystem where the government is the customer a customer. Government is a customer where uh, new players have entered, there's robustness, and the space is just another place to do business. So I think, uh, any questions with that? I think that's it. Yep. Hi. Hi, Jeff. My name is Jaren, and my question for you is uh, two parts. Uh, one is, with your existing business model, um, you presented a very compelling vision for having commercially operated space stations uh, potentially in orbit and other places. I'm curious, uh, number one, if you see a need to shift your business model in order to get closer to um, having the commercial space station uh, business a reality, and if so, um, what do you think are the next big steps in order to make that a reality? So, I mean, we get some criticism at Nanorax. People say, oh, you know, you got all these customers and you're doing all this stuff. But, you know, it's a government space station. You know, the taxpayer paid for, for that space station. Uh, you know, can you really stand on your own commercially? And it's a, it's a very nuanced question because, first off, Almost no market doesn't, you know, especially in the states. First off, historically, all new markets get government support. It's just the way, you know, whether it was transportation, whether it was railroads, or whether it was aviation. Uh, by the way, uh, from the previous talk on uh, with Virgin uh, Orbit, uh, it was interesting that um, Boeing. I forget the gentleman's name, Mr. Boeing. Uh, when he started Boeing, he then ten years later started an airplane company uh, called United. And it was Congress that forced them to split apart. So I think we are in a period where we look 20 years out and the business model will be different. Um, yes, we will have to change our business model. Yes, some of our costs will have to go up, though we always think there'll be government support for the foreseeable future. Um, yes, I won't be able maybe to do educational uh, uh, students at, a, at, at, at that price or something. Um, we will lose some things in a commercial uh, platform, but we gain a lot. We gain efficiencies. One of the things I didn't mention is at Nanorax, we average nine months to get a payload. Uh, we can sign a contract today, and within nine months, I can get you on the space station. 
we have customers coming in thinking this is Amazon Prime, okay? And they get mad at us when it's, you know, more than two weeks. Well, NASA averages three years through their own system, the same safety review, the same, it's their system. And they average three years and NanoRax is nine months, so we're fast. Um, we gain in what we're able to do. We gain, we, we can't do marketing now, we can't do advertising, although that's changing. The administrator has said he wants to open that up. And indeed, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, has now gone fully commercial on the International Space Station. I was over there three weeks ago, reaching agreements on things I could bring up, and they, it's, complete, it's very commercial now. And, uh, and suddenly, NASA in the United States finds itself not the most commercial. Uh, but NASA was the pioneer on the International Space Station for allowing companies like mine to work. So yes, we'll have to change the, the business model, um, but I'm looking forward to that with great joy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would just be more things we're able to do. Um, uh, even today, some of the folks at NASA say, don't we let you do everything? No. They don't. There's, there's both manufacturing and advertising and branding and, and, and just uh, not having to go through a gatekeeper. I, I'm always fighting for what has to go up on the station. And I'm lucky they, they, they're very kind to NanoRacks, but in a, in a more efficient environment, a commercially run environment, I think our prices would come down, the costs would, co the costs would come down, prices would come down, and we could do more. We, it's been hard to do art on the International Space Station. I had a very interesting customer that wanted to do an art project, and that's, uh, just, just trying to explain it to the space agency became too much. So I look forward to changing the business model and figuring out what works in a commercial environment. Yeah. So do you have a sense if, if you came up with a, a credible design for the use of a, a Atlas upper stage, um, do you have a sense of what they would charge you to have it? I mean, if they're throwing it away anyway. Yes, we, um, uh, we have been in discussions uh, for the past uh, year, year and a half uh, with ULA, with the shareholders of ULA on, on how to structure this. And um, they are being very kind in that they're allowing me to say, I don't know at this point what the revenue is, but I know I'll share it with you. Okay, I mean, uh, and, and so because for them, this is uh, additional, uh, the, an asset which right now is being thrown away as junk. Uh, someone's coming in and is willing to make the investment uh, to make it a tangible, some extra valuation. And so um, we're working that through. We're, we're working through and we've been signing MOUs and taking it step by step. So you talked a little bit about how outposts will enable this this ecosystem in space that'll really like get things moving, um, and I think like I think like a lot of technologies like reusable rockets are all about opening it up and letting people start do, doing things. Um, but I think that like there's been a little bit of disappointment on the demand side where there's like these research applications, um, like maybe maybe it's commercial tourism that's that's like the application that's going to get everything going. Maybe it's you know on like like you mentioned it's deployment on demand. Um, but I was wondering what you think the the thing is that's gonna the that's thing. gonna the thing what's is the or the app. Just say it. What's yeah. the app? What's the okay. what's the app that's gonna let you commercialize this? For me, it's on orbit manufacture and deployment of satellites. I think in 10, 15 years, 90% of small satellites up to 150 kilograms will be manufactured in space, except for the sensor. Uh, we already have robots on the ISS. They're doing, they were doing pharmaceutical uh, work for us, and they're, they're moving like this, and, and the astronaut used to do that. And the idea of building a satellite on the ground, getting it to a launch site, getting it deployed, getting it sent up, deploying on the same day whether you want, as launch, whether you want to or not, uh, why not have uh, an unmanned platform, you press the button, Man, you have 12 sensors, 12 optics uh, stored there. We're already storing stuff on ISS for customers. So now you're storing the, uh, the, the sensors, you manufacture the bus, you manufacture the circuit boards, and uh, the robot puts the sensor on, uh, maybe the solar panels, and you deploy at will. 
And, and when I look at in the unmanned, when I, not the space tourism, we see a market for space tourism, but um, a sustainable market, but, in the un, but you can't combine the two platforms. Uh, in the unmanned, I, see the, I know there's a proven market. We're in that now. We've deployed over 200 satellites, um, both commercial and strategic. The idea of manufacturing in space, deploying on demand, is the, uh, the future for platforms. And, and uh, I think uh, will be, I think as additive manufacturing comes further of age, uh, the power of these things, I mean literally the power, the, what, what one is able to, to provide in terms of power uh, is extraordinary. And so you start to get larger and larger uh, additive manufacturing units and what we'll be able to do, I think it will just change a lot. Um, so, I, I'm very interested in rocketry, and so I was wondering, um, as you're talking about, like, then we're a perfect team. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you're talking about, so as the payloads change and it becomes more raw materials over satellites, do you think that the current um, rush for small satellite launchers is going to die down? We're going to be back to bigger vehicles that are just putting raw material up. Like, I'm just wondering, like, what you think with um, the satellite background. We, we, when we have meetings with new uh, launch vehicle folks, we tell them that you're in the same day deployment business. And every time it's like a routine. And they go, what? And then we explain, you know, that you, you're, everybody's in the same day deployment, but we think part of the future is, is uh, you know, to control it. And you'll also be in the raw materials business. And there's always this look of, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of it that way before. So I, I, first off, the, I mean, the cool thing about engineers is you present something and they go, Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, um, I don't know. I I don't. I understand what you're saying. I mean, I I I I wouldn't be happy if the future is uh, uh, Blue, Blue Origin and SpaceX alone. I just wouldn't. Okay, it's just the way I am. I, I you know I I hope that there's dedicated launch vehicles that that uh, can meet the demands and and that there's small companies. I happen to believe in in uh, small companies and and like that. Uh, and so I I don't know I don't know what the answer is. But I'm hoping I'm hoping that space does not become. I mean one of the reasons we're working internationally is. Um, uh, Overseas, they appreciate the, the uh, approach we have in the States, the cost efficiencies, the open mind, the, uh, the way we work with the governments. I'm hopeful there's a role in the future for these smaller companies, and we don't just go into an era of domination by a few companies. But maybe I'm a romantic. Yes? Uh, I have the microphone. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Lydia from Technology Policy Program here uh -huh. at MIT. So I'm just wondering, is there any regulatory constraints that you have to overcome in order to launch this business idea? This is a really cool uh, okay. idea. Well, every Wednesday we have to overcome a, a, a regulatory. It, it's just a huge battle. Uh, first, let me say a general question. The federal agencies in the states have been really, really good at going, uh, changing uh, as we come in with space stations. Quick example, early on when we began deploying from the space station, uh, we, we had a situation where somebody was supposed to, we had a customer who's going to be deployed, they couldn't make the mission, I forget exactly, and we moved it to another mission. And I was so proud that with the cadence you have to the International Space Station, that you know it goes up six, eight, ten times a year. I could, it was like to me, this is business. You're on this one. I'll move you this one. The customer went berserk. They said we have a license from the FAA for this launch, and I said, but you're not being deployed from this one. You're being deployed. And the silence. They hadn't thought of it. The FAA was issuing the license still for let's say SpaceX nine, okay. But they're not deploying from SpaceX 9. It's a bus. It's a 747. They're being carried up to the space station, and it's the space station that's deploying them. So we had to work, and we've been working with the FAA, for example. It's not really your question, but it, working with the FAA, and now they accept that the space station is the deployment 
platform, not the vehicle taking you up. So when they're working with Rocket Lab, you may get a license to the, uh, for deploy on the Rocket Lab. When you're working with Nanoracks, you better get one for a more general than, uh, than the specific launch you may be booked on. Um, one of the biggest hurdles in terms of regulation may be uh, under the uh, Outer Space uh, Affairs, or was it 1969 or something, uh, and a later amendment by the U.S., um, who owns that vehicle, uh, that platform? Uh, right now, ULA owns it, uh, and if, how do we take control of it? Uh, in an earlier lifetime, I had a company in 2000 called Mircorp, and we leased the Russian space station for two years. And it uh, created a lot of trouble. NASA was very upset. And, uh, but we kept the Mir up for two, two and a half years longer. And in that exa uh, example, we, we leased the station from the Russian owner of the space station. But one day there was a knock on, and it was a Dutch company, and one day there was a knock on, on the door in my office in Holland, and it was a, a government official from Holland saying, under the Outer Space Affairs Treaty, as we read it, Mircorp is a Dutch company, therefore, Holland is now responsible for the Mir, uh, for this part of the Mir space station. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't think this through. And he said, we just want you to know, we passed legislation yesterday. We take ownership. We take a responsibility <laughs> under the United Nations provision. I was like, wow, <laughs> I've loved Holland ever since. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what that would have cost me in lobbyists here, but. Um, so there are certain things on, uh, on who owns the platform, how do we uh, make sure uh, the, the platform is uh, brought back to a safe, um, where it gets destroyed or parked in a, in, an, in a graveyard orbit. So that's probably one of the biggest hurdles that we would face. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you've coined the term um, greening the space exploration movement, and yeah. you make a very compelling case with the, uh, recycling the second stage of rockets. Just to focus on LEO, I'd like to have your vision in, let's say, 10 years about the key elements of this market. I see one infrastructure, which is uh, constellations, another infrastructures, which is actually your platforms. So how many assets do you see? And... Uh, could you comment on that? Sure. Um, f first, uh, you said LEO. Yeah. But LEO is still a big place. And so a lot of these constellations are going to be a 1,000 miles up. And, and so I just want to first say that uh, we're not predicting that we're going to have three or four or five platforms and, and one web's going to be crashing into them. OK, so uh, uh, w but what I would envision in the decade is there'll be six or eight to 10 uh, space stations. Some will be owned by government, some will be owned by the private sector, but all will be commercially operated. Yes, okay, all will be commercial. So even China today is in discussions on commercial utilization of their station. So we may see, you know, maybe Russia will have its own station, uh, but there will be commercial opportunities. And then there will be the constellations. And some of the constellations will be looking down, some will be looking up, some will be talking to each other. Uh, and, and, and you'll have a complete architecture. You'll have way stations uh, to take us into cislunar. You'll have uh, warehouses, fuel depots. This can easily be fuel depots. Uh, we, at Nanoracks, we always go with the non-sexy things. It's just the way we are. So, because we have too many big boys in this industry, so uh, someone else may do a hotel, but we'll be, give them the platform. Someone else uh, may want to go to Mars, and we can be a fuel station for them. So, I see the uh, infrastructure. One of the ironies is we're having trouble here in the states and and funding for infrastructure, but I think we're going to do quite well in in space on infrastructure development. So, I think it'll be a range of vehicles up down uh, a range of uh, platforms we call outposts and uh, there will also be the first outposts in deep space uh, owned by governments owned by like if the deep space gateway nasa's deep space gateway they're supposed to announce in june uh, the the ppe i think it's called to uh, and so you, you'll begin to see the 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 um, infrastructure development Did you say a very low for the platform? yes uh, well, my, my answer is always the same. Uh, it depends on my customers. I go with the customer. 
So I would envision uh, that uh, for fuel depots, and as long as you're, you know, in Leo, you're fine. Um, but I don't know what the, the, the future will be. So, okay, this gentleman. Hi, I wanted to ask a question about spent satellites. So I know there are a few about different spent satellites. Yeah, exactly. I know there are a few different groups that are working on um, refurbishing satellites, essentially. Um, what opportunities do you see for reusing satellites that have just run out of fuel? Well, uh, it's not really my area. The way I can answer it is, and I don't think uh, Maxar would mind my pitching them. Uh, they've done this publicly. Uh, Maxar, ha you know, there used to be Laral and, and uh, MDA Robotics and a few others that come together with new name Maxar. And uh, they have a, a presentation where they say, if, if our future is simply to put up a satellite, have it last 15 years if it's a big bird or two years if it's a CubeSat and then throw it away and start with new ones, we're dead. To be competitive, we have to also reuse that in-space hardware. And so that's one of the reasons why Maxar has partnered with us on this is they're trying to also figure out what can we do with in-space assets? How do we repurpose them? Probably the most simplistic, maybe the wrong way to say it, the most logical uh, application for a spent satellite is this raw material for additive manufacturing into uh, outposts. That's be my guess. I was going to say nobody mentioned the elephant in the room, but they almost did. Debris. Nobody yeah. mentioned yeah. that at all today. Not really. Not well, really. I, I, tackled I, it. Yeah, I. I one of the reasons is that at Nanorax, we, we, we're in a good spot. The satellites we deploy from the space station naturally deorbit uh, within a year. I think there's a, U, uh, there's a UN provision now that over a set time, I think it's like 25 years. I'm, I, I don't, I'm, how much is it? It is 25. So uh, the satellites from the space station come down naturally, and we don't violate uh, that. Um, when I'm talking about repurposing these second stages, right now, they're junk. So we're at least making, uh, when you make use of something, it's no longer junk. And so you paint it, it looks nice, okay? And so, uh, yes, it's, it is an issue, but I'm hopeful we're taking the first steps uh, and, and there are some foundations, nonprofits looking at this, Maxar's looking at this, we're looking at it. Uh, lots of folks are looking at this. Uh, it, as space is becoming more commercial, Let's not stuff trash into these cargo vehicles and throw them away. How do you reuse this stuff? And so I think we're entering a period where we're concerned, and that's a good beginning, because the end result is going to be more, not only less pollution, but more efficient use of the assets. So, is that it? Great. Thank you very much.